Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, a very warm welcome to this conversation with Adrian Morehouse, uh, old Broad Bradfordian from the class of 1982. My name's Paul Mertz. I'm one of the assistant heads here at BGS, and it's an enormous, an enormous pleasure to be able to welcome Adrian back to BGS this evening, uh, albeit virtually, uh, for a conversation. Adrian's name is quite literally inscribed into the fabric of BGS, uh, courtesy of the Adrian Morehouse swimming pool. It began for Adrian uh, with the Airborough Dolphins at Geisley's Leisure Centre. By the age of 15, he was already on the senior Great Britain swimming team. He won the 100 metre breaststroke gold at the 1982 at Commonwealth Games in Australia. This wasn't without some pressure. His mum had saved all her child allowance so that she could be there and there was also the small matter of the Queen being present for the final. Of course, he won. The first in a series of major successes. Adrian spent 12 years as international level swimmer with sustained world number one ranking for six consecutive years. He was the first person to swim a sub one, sub one minute 100 meter breaststroke and achieved a lifetime's ambition when he won gold at the Seoul Olympics in 1988. Upon winning, he didn't forget his Yorkshire roots, exclaiming, I'm a tyke, we never give up. Adrian's been appointed an MBE for his services to sport and has inspired a new generation of British swimmers. Surprising then to learn that he almost quit entirely after disappointment in the 1984 Olympics. His decision to give the sport one last roll of the dice was without doubt a vindication and not just for the sporting world. Adrian's translated his swimming successes into the business world. Since retiring from swimming, he's enjoyed a successful career as a management consultant, co-founding the leadership and development consultancy Lane 4 in 1995, working with such organisations as the Metropolitan Police and Coca-Cola. The multi-award winning Lane 4 was ranked in the Sunday Times top 100 best small companies to work for for 12 successive years. Adrian continues to provide swimming commentary for the BBC and he served as a Team GB ambassador at the London Olympics in 2012. As well as speaking to us about his time at BGS and about swimming, Adrian uh, is going to talk to us about uh, leading through crisis. Um, he's had a lot of experience of resilience and determination, and I can think of no better speaker for this timely subject. So Adrian, uh, welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask you to do your uh, to say a few words about uh, leadership in times of crisis in a few minutes time. But I wonder if we could start with your time at BGS and your early days as an emerging swimmer. We've heard that you joined the national senior squad at age 15, uh, by which at which time you were number two in the country to Duncan Goodhue. But what inspired you to take swimming seriously and at what age did that happen? OK, uh, hi, everybody. It's, it's great to start off with my time at BGS. I guess it's the, the furthest back. Um, so the swimming thing was um, I went from learn to swim to racing. You know, it's basically the lady that taught me to swim said uh, we have a racing club. Do you fancy doing that at the age of about eight? Um, I, I think I was super um, fortunate that the school had a swimming pool. I mean, I, I can't say anything other than that, really, because I was in it from about the age of when I was in Thornville, then Clock House. Um, from the age of like 10 and then 11 senior school and I was in the swimming club in as you said Geisley it was City of Bradford by then actually it's now Leeds but uh, so I spent a lot of time with the Bradford swimming club but also swimming with the school swimming club and Jack Sanderson and then Peter Aykroyd were the two teachers that helped me um, encourage me in fact Jack Sanderson was well they both were pretty pivotal because I remember not really liking school, <laughs> so forget that. I mean, you know, we'll talk about school in a minute. But um, I, I, did, I was a bit of a shy, bit of a Billy No Mates kind of kid, um, and I didn't really want to go. And I remember somebody saying, "Oh, you've got a bit of swimming talent. You should go to swimming." And I said, well, you know, "It happened to be after school. I'm not going after school. I'm not staying in prolonging this experience." Um, and Jack I remember phoning my mum. Apparently, I found out about a year later and told my mum that she should try and encourage him, me, to go. And so she bribed me with Mars bars. And so that was how I, so she said, look, if I give you Mars bar after swimming session, will you go swimming? So that was it. So it's Jack and Mars bars. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I guess from then, um, the school swimming club was brilliant for me, actually. You know, we, we did early morning swimming two, three times a week before school. And, you know, teachers came, Pete Aykroyd, Jack opened it up for us. 
we saw them at lunch times, and I just supplemented that with Bradford Swimming Club, City of uh, City of Bradford Swimming Club. And so by the age of about twelve, I was going about eight times a week. And then when the, some of the coaches left Bradford and the swimming club, and things moved, I needed a lot more pool time than the school could give me. I moved to the City Elites. So by 14, 15, that's when it sort of took off into international level because I was with an Olympic coach in Leeds. I was in an Olympic pool and the whole thing was geared to getting you on the national team in a very different way. So my sort of 15 to 18, my latter sixth form years at school and my O levels actually were peppered with uh, random visits to school because I was always somewhere else in the country or the world um, swimming. And so I kind of just limped along through my qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's, I can see this is going to be a very honest evening, um, limping through studies. <laughs> Having made the decision to, yeah. to go with swimming, yeah. uh, feedback here. Yeah. See if that yeah. changes. Oh. Right, sorry if there's a bit of feedback. I, I, no, it seems to have gone for now. Um, Having made the decision to go with swimming, uh, it takes an enormous amount of commitment and time, more perhaps than, than any other sport. How did you manage to, to keep up with your training and your studies or, or are you, did your studies suffer? Well, yeah, I did OK. I, I, yeah, but the problem was with my O-levels, um, there, there was a bit of the World School Swimming Championship was on and I was selected for it. And it was the, the, the same two weeks as O-levels. So I managed to do a negotiation with Dag Smith, with David Smith, the headmaster at the time, where I took them the week before I went to the schools. Um, but it didn't. I won the World School Championships, but I think I got three O levels, so I kind of didn't go so well there. But then I took a few more. I retook a few, and I got a few in the end. I got about seven, and then so did I. I I, I love I love being at the school. I love the culture. I love the the teachers were super supportive. Apart from the French teacher who used to throw a board rubber at me to wake me up when I fell asleep uh, in class. Won't name him. Um, but yeah, they were really supportive. They knew what was going on, and frankly. You know, by the age of 17, 18, as you mentioned, I was, um, well, by 17, I'd good year had retired and I was number one in Britain and I was on the way to win the Commonwealth Games. So I failed all my A levels and won the Commonwealth Games in the same year. <laughs> that's, that's, that sounds like a, a good trade off since it came off for you. Well, what, was really, what was really weird was, I mean, it, we had Founders Day and they did all the announcements who's going where at university. And I was sat there with some of my mates who were going to some great universities. I mean, the school's been brilliant at putting people through a wonderful education around in education. And I remember them announcing that Morehouse was going to go to the University of California, Berkeley. And they all, they all looked at me and went, what well, are you going to University of California? You failed your levels. I went, yeah, but that's a swimming scholarship for you. So, so that was quite nice. <laughs> so I made it. <laughs> And did, did you have time to, to follow any other sports or activities at school or, or was it just swim, swim, swim? I was not very sporty. I mean, really, swimming was a saviour for me because I remember Wednesday afternoon we used to do rugby first, swimming afterwards. And I would, was quite small for my age and quite puny. And I used to, some of the, if there's anybody's on that was in the same class as me or same year would know this. Well, I might remember it, but I used to run around trying to avoid the ball on the pitch and avoid where people were jumping on each other. Because so rugby first was dirty. You get the bugger beater out of you, you and, and then you were, you know, it was horrible. And then you get in a warm swimming pool. Nobody would like bother you. You get your own lane. So kind of I stuck to swimming. I was all right at long jump, I think, once. I think I won one long jump thing. <laughs> And um, um, among um, our audience um, this afternoon, there are undoubtedly some immensely talented athletes, and they'll be teaching parents. parents. I'm sure, I'm they'll sure they'll be talking about the support, the support you got from your parents in your journey to the top. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a bit about family life when you were a teenager and an emerging swimming talent? Yeah, interesting. It was interesting. I think I was. Um... I was difficult as a kid, I think, because I, I was I was trying to work out you know, the whole teenage thing. You're working out who you are, what your identity is. I'm at a great school. I'm not doing so well in studies, but I'm loving swimming. It's an escape. It's a place I'm successful. So a lot of my self-esteem was built around that. I was also pretty angry. I used to listen to loud. I, I was in the punk era, so 76, 78, 77 and heavy metal music. I remember going to St. George's Hall watching um, heavy metal. Um, and my parents had to put up with all that. They were brilliant. I mean, I love my parents to bits and my father sadly passed away last year, but um, they were so supportive and they would, you know, in the morning, my dad would take me before school. So five o'clock, the alarm would go off in Bingley and we'd get up and he'd drive me to Leeds and then we'd come home. He dropped me at school. Usually I was late walking in at the balcony in the price hall. Um, and then and my mum would be there at 4.15 to pick me up and take me back to Leeds for an evening session. 
and wait and they both had to wait for me while I did this two hour swimming session so they were they were brilliant um never pushy though and what was what was amazing for me was that they what I understood from them was you know we'll give you opportunity but you've got to take the opportunity the, the work hard thing has to come from you the commitment has to come from you but we'll model that you, you well, if it's important to you you're passionate about it we'll support you um it's quite a funny story actually my, my dad was on the balcony at Leeds once and we'd got um he wanted to get involved because he didn't really know swimming because he was a cricket and football guy you know he, did, he didn't really get swimming um he said I want to get involved I want to watch what you're doing and we got a stopwatch it was actually <laughs> so, uh, on cornflake packets you could collect the tops and you get a free gift you know so if you remember those people <laughs> old enough you'd send off these to packet tops and you get a free thing we got a stopwatch from Kellogg's like through the packet thing and he sat on the balcony with a stopwatch one day and I remember going in and he didn't ever use it again and I forgot I just, that's interesting he was on the balcony with a stopwatch watching my swimming and I asked him about two months later I said what happened to you in that stopwatch he said well Terry Terry Dennison the coach he said he got me at the end of the session before you were getting changed while you're getting changed he got me he almost put me against the wall he said Clifford I noticed you with a stopwatch what are you doing with a stopwatch and my dad said well I just taking an interest and Terry said I'm the coach I time him, I give him feedback, I tell him off, you're the dad, when he gets home, you love him. That's all you've got to do. Never <laughs> never have a stopwatch at my pool again. And that was it. So my dad had no idea what my times were ever, ever since. In fact, I broke the world record when I was about 25. And I remember phoning my dad because he didn't make that race. I said, oh, I just saw a 61.2. He said, is that any good? Oh yeah, it's quite good, it's a world record. So oh, that's good then. <laughs> so that's the kind of parent you kind of want. So they're catchy when it, because you know, ultimately it's hard. I mean, look, I mean, j joking aside, it's hard graft, right? And it's, you know, you've got to face into all sorts of pressure, all sorts of adversity and you, you know, it's, it's pretty aggressive. And you know, when you're at that level and you need care, you need support network around you. And if that support network's giving you grief as well, you, you don't need that. So you need a loving environment to come back to, I found. Um, um, I'm sure, I'm sure lots of BGS fans will relate, relate to that. that. You mentioned your world record. Mm. You, you, you actually, actually exactly, exactly the same time, three, three times, times. Yes. in about 12 months, I think it was. Did that surprise you or were you really down to those hundredths of a second? Uh, like, like? Um, it really, really pissed me off. <laughs> If it surprised me, it really, really bothered me because I wanted to break it, right? So you get it was my world record. So at the end of the day, I'm just equal in the same time. It really was upsetting. I mean, it was um it surprised this third time it surprised me a lot actually because I'd prepared and I thought I was gonna break it by half a second. And I was really hoping to drop the time significantly. Because ultimately when you get to that level, you you know when the world record is your best time, you're really competing against yourself. You're trying to get yourself to be as fast as you can be. Um so it wasn't racing, it was more, well, it was racing. I enjoyed the racing, but I also enjoyed pushing the boundary. Got it, Lovely. thank you, yes. yes. Um, um, you're quite brutally honest about your own swimming career, um, yeah. as likely to be heard talking about your disappointments at the LA Olympics in 1984 and at the World yeah. Champions in 86, as uh, about all your gold medals in World Championships, Commonwealth Games, and of course the big one in Seoul. What did you learn from the hard times and how did it help you to progress as an athlete? Well, it's, it's interesting because this subject, I think, is relevant. Uh, life, life lesson, resilience. How do you stay resilient? How do you bounce back? How do you overcome defeat and failure? And how do you face into it? And I think that I'd never really experienced failure um, as an athlete. I mean, <laughs> as a student, I had. Um, but as an athlete, I'd, I sort of had from 14, 15, you know, I was I was 15 on the senior team. I 16 when Goodyear retired as Britain's number one. So I had a really good progression through to the age of 20 in the 84 Olympics. So I went to my first Olympics and I'd already won the US Open. Um, I was ranked number one in the world going in. So there's a lot of pressure. I, f I felt a lot of pressure on myself to achieve this dream. And I, you know, by now I'd, I'd had four years as a, an international world-class swimmer. Um, and I thought this was my moment, the 84 Olympics. And coming forth was just devastating. And then, yeah, it's quite well documented, but it really did knock me for six. Because I didn't understand, I understand I, I, in retrospect, I understood why I lost. I could analyze, I could look at it. The guys were faster than me. I'd got a couple of things wrong. And, you know, I had to take responsibility for that. But the, in the moment, you kind of devastated. But bouncing back, I think a lot of it is about understanding your worth, your self-esteem and what's important and actually getting a sense of perspective. So for me, you know, getting a sense of perspective and 
frankly, losing a swimming race. I mean, it's like, what, how, what is that a big deal? You know, people are losing their lives, right? So, so when I started to understand what's going on in the world and and it's quite interesting. I, what I realised was I was a I was simply a person fortunate enough to extend my childhood. I think all professional sports people are just bloody lucky. What you get to do is to play sport for longer than the kids at school. I used to get to, I did this 28. And so unless you, when you start to realise how fortunate you are and that you're playing and that, yes, you, you, tri you take what you do very seriously, but don't take yourself very seriously. That's kind of the motto I, ever, I had after that point, which was, you know, work hard. Yeah, you're talented at what you do. You're in a great position, but really, really, no, you are just playing games. That, that, that sounds like extraordinarily good advice, taking taking yourself not too seriously, but what you do seriously. Yes, I'm sure a lot of people can identify with that. Um, you were known as a fast finisher. Obviously, anyone who against, against you had to deal with that. How conscious were you of your opponent's strengths and weaknesses, and, and did they affect the way you approached the race? Yeah, I mean, it just it's probably worth talking about the H8 games in this one, because that was absolutely true of the H8 games, because I was... I knew that Volkov, the guy next to me, was a very strong starter um, and he was always going to go out fast and my start was not one of the best, but I had to stay as close as I could to him. And by the turn, I was in sixth position um, and coming back, I knew I would come back strong, so I was watching out for him and at the turn, I mean, you're not supposed to look too much, but I could see he was way ahead of me and he broke the world record actually for 50 metres. Um, but that idea that I knew I was going to come back strongly was critical to me. Um, and I think he knew in the back of his head. So with every stroke, I was catching him up, which was quite helpful. Um, and then overtook him. Are you struggling with sound? Or am I? Yeah. yeah. Right? I the and um, the deputy head, Mr. Baldwin, is just trying to sort me out. I can play headphones on mine as well if you want. I think I'm back with you at the moment, but I think there's a bit of echo on the line. So if you're listening to this, I'm really sorry about that. Let me try. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can do this. I, I use the phone. That'd be better, maybe. Is that better for me? Thank you. I think I'm not sure how that's going to go. It was it was feedback at our end. We thought we're not sure. Can somebody give us feedback and see if that's okay right now? Does that help if I put headphones on? And, as the, and it I seems to be, that seems okay at the moment. Yeah. Should we carry on? <laughs> Let's see how we go. <laughs> um, uh, when you won Olympic gold in 1988, uh, you got to stand on the top step as the national anthem was played, which is, of course, something very, very few people will ever experience. Can you remember what was going through your mind as you collected the greatest award in your sport? <laughs> yeah. um, it, it, it's actually probably the half an hour from touching the wall to getting the medal is one of the most extreme emotional moments I've ever had in my life, apart from having the birth, say, watching the birth of my four children. Um, but the, when you touch the wall, you and I realised I won. When I, it's what happens is to manage pressure in an Olympic race like that, you have to minimise what it means to you. The worst thing in the world is when you stand on the block getting ready for the race, is you thinking about how mag, the magnitude of what you're trying to achieve. So you're not thinking it's the whole world, it's the Olympics, it's the only time every four years. Da, da, da. You don't. You have to minimise it down to it's two lengths. I've got to beat seven people. I've got to get a good dive. And that's it. So what you've done is you put this lid on the pressure cooker. You're minimising everything. And then when you finish and you spot that you've won, it pops off. And that's how, the only way I could describe it metaphorically is like the lid flies off. And so you get all excited and you punch the air and do ridiculous things with your face and you get really excited. And then so that euphoria then lasts and it, it sort of as you will parade back round. So you walk and you get your tracksuit and they take you into rooms to get ready and comb your hair, which is quite nice when I used to have some, you know, comb your hair a bit. And then they say, right, and the door opens and they say, right, you're now parading. And they have this music to parade around the pool with your tracksuits on to get behind the block to, you know, the three uh, podium. And there's 16,000 people in this stadium. And I've sat there for 20 minutes waiting for the door to open. And I got super emotional because I'm just thinking, oh, you know, so the realisation just, it all floods in what you've done. And that was huge. That was so intense. And I walked out. I remember the door opened. I walked out to walk to the podium. I was in tears. I could not contain my tears. So I was crying all the way around. Got on the podium. And then when they started put the medal around my neck and actually national anthem, I was in bits. That was the real problem. I tried to sing it, but I got nowhere. So. <laughs> 
No, thanks for the, describing that. I mean, that, that's that's very, very vivid for those of us who will never get near that sort of experience. And um, what you learned as a swimmer, of course, has, has stood you in very good stead as a, a management consultant after you finished swimming. Uh, you've been kind enough to offer us a, a, a few snippets of the advice which you give to your clients at Lane 4. Um, can I ask you just to, to take over for a bit and, and, and talk to us about leadership in, in times of crisis like we're going through at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I've yeah, and, and I've got, I can talk forever on this subject, it's my day to day job, but and I would like you to interrupt or anybody's got any questions and we can we can take the, I'd like it to be a conversation as well. But so, so that it was quite interesting, I think, is a lot of what I learned in terms of resilience as an individual is hugely important. So Lane 4, we've got about 200 people, employees, about another 200 around the world. So, and I took Lane 4 through the 2008, 2009 crisis. And so, personally being able to manage yourself and almost like well that, that phrase you know when all around you there are people are losing their heads you don't need to be losing yours because if you're in a leadership position there's something about retaining a calmness and an even even emotional attitude throughout it however you feel underneath and it's the same with the olympics it's the same in business for me it's almost like i'm a i'm still a performer i'm still optimistic but i'm realistic and so I think there's something quite important when you take in an organization through something. The other thing that's quite important, it's like I was talking about the Olympic final, is you control what you can control. So just before I was about to, in that high pressure situation before the race, I knew I couldn't control my rivals. I couldn't control anything else other than my dive. That was the first thing I could do. That was in my control. So it's true now, right? So what is in our control? What can't we do anything about? Well, they've locked it down, so we can't do anything about that. Much as I can complain and I can you know, shout out, why are we not like New Zealand and we want to, why are we like Jacinda Ardern's done a great job and Boris is rubbish. I can do all that, but you know what? I can't control that right now. So what I can do is I can strip it back and go, okay, what can we do? And what I found is interesting is what we can control is the relevance of our product, our offer, our service. Who's buying it right now? What's the price? And what's the service quality that we give them so something about and i think it's we do a lot of work on organization resilience as well as personal resilience for the last 15 years and resilient strategy for an organization is making sure you anticipate what's happening and you understand the marketplace what's relevant what you can do something with and you adapt it and you prioritize and you change now look i don't want to be appear naive and I think it's very difficult for a lot of people I think this time is one of the worst times and we're gonna have to let a few people go we put loads of people on furlough we'll come through it we had a decent financial position beforehand but I've got friends that are suffering badly and I think that for me to say look you're trying to be even emotionally find out where you can get support the people the friends the colleagues find out where you know stay healthy you know, make sure you are walking if you exercise exercise I mean, I, get, I walk mainly now. I occasionally do some lake swimming because all the pools are closed. Um, but so looking after yourself, health, you know, healthy fitness, health, and also where you get your supports from. But then remind yourself that you're good. There's something about being able to understand your own self-esteem and your own identity and who you are. It doesn't change just because the external thing goes a bit pear-shaped. So I think there's something about that bit about, you know, managing your state, staying calm, understanding yourself, staying fit for life and working out where your supports are. Try not to take, try, try to stay light if you can, as much as you can. I know it's some heavy stuff happening, um, but none of us sail through it. What I realized through my life is that everyone has ups and downs. I mean, we, you know, we, hit, we hit, ha, suffered badly in 2008, nine, and we get, we're suffering now. You know, we put 200, we put 90 people on furlough um, and I'm not sure we can bring them all back. And so I think there's something that's, but then we're still alive, just about. <laughs> you got to keep going, right? And, and sorry, alive as a business. But then perspective, some people didn't make it through this with their lives. So it's like, get, get some perspective. So those things, they intertwine. So have I got any, I'm very conscious of a mixed audience on this on this um, webinar and that, yeah, business-wise, there's loads of stuff we're putting out on LinkedIn and, and there's some real specific stuff in staying motivated. How do you encourage employees to, even on furlough or, or on on the pitch, off the pitch, we use the phrase. Um, how do you keep people connected? You know, tell them the truth. Be as open on this as you can. Don't hide stuff. 
don't think you have to solve it all yourself. If you've got employees, they, they're kind of usually keen to have a go. And if you as leaders think that you should do everything because the weight of the world should be on you, you need to get rid of that thought to start with because there's lots of great people in your organization want to help. And so often we find people try and lift all the decision making to themselves because they're in charge. And But actually what you need to do is get lots of people involved. Um, so we've done that quite a lot. It's working quite well, actually. Um, but we've always been an open and honest organization. I always wanted to create a company that felt for the employees like it felt when I was on the Olympic squad. So when you get to that level, you've got a place where people are driven, sure, they're, they've got some, some talent, but the releasing of the talent is because great team ethic, great coaching, great spirit, learning mindset, you take feedback, you give feedback, um, you're not precious, you're not egocentric, there's a humility in there. So when you create an organisation, if you bring people together that have those qualities, it makes it easier to survive this stuff, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, thank, thanks for that. And, and, and it's, I'm really glad that in this in this webinar, um, we're, we're able to benefit both from your experience as a, a top level athlete and also from your management consultancy time. So so thanks for sharing your thoughts there. Um, just notice, um, I'm not sure how whether everybody who's listening to this is aware, but the, you can send questions through for Adrian if you want to. There's, a, there's an icon in the top corner of your screen which looks like a pair of speech bubbles with a question mark in it. And one or two people have found it um, uh, and, and, and some haven't, obviously, um, but it's there if you want it. And I just wanted to let you know, uh, Adrian, there's a there's a message. It's anonymous. <laughs> uh, he says somebody says just want to say hello for, to Adrian from a fellow 1982 leaver. So so one of your mates is on, um, but sure. he then follows it up with wasn't the teacher who threw through the board rubber a maths guy? <laughs> if not, there were two of them. <laughs> there were two of them and it was the French one. It, was, it, was, yeah, it wasn't Lenny. Lenny was my supporter, actually. They masked, yeah, I, was, I did mass with Lenny Butler. No, it was the other one, the French one. <laughs> Super, right. Um, I've, we just had the interviews today uh, for the head boy and head girl for yes. next year for, for Bradford Grammar School. Um, with either hat on, management consultant or, or, or former swimmer, um, what advice would you give them as, as leaders of our student body uh, in, in a, a busy grammar school like BGS? Well, um, I, I can. It's great. It's interesting because I can look at it with with hindsight. I I don't have any bitterness about <laughs> head boy or head girl, you know, having been not even selected as a prefect because I was never there. So I'm I'm really cool with you guys doing that job. It's a fantastic job. Um, my brother was head boy, by the way, two years after me. But um, it's a leadership position, right? And yet you're representative. I think what's quite important is that you engage with your populations and your students and you you create this link between so you represent but you also understand the understanding of your own peer groups of students but you also you need to understand the teachers so for me there's something about understanding each stakeholder sorry to use jargon but what their needs are because when you start to understand other people's opinion and perspective is when you get really a really good environment so there's something about knowing you represent students and the, your fellow pupils and yet understanding the, the issues, but then understanding what it might feel like to be on the other side in terms of you guys, the, the faculty or whatever. And then having a, an honest conversation that, you know, good dialogue, good conversation about what the needs of each group. are. I mean, I've, I'm quite a qualified mediator as well. So understanding needs and at the, the base level is quite important because you can often fight about something or disagree about something that actually you both want the same thing. So if you can strip it back to what you really both want, I think that's quite important to so listen, listening um, and, and ask, yeah, ask your group what they want from you. I think it's something I always do that. Um, because ultimately it's interesting because as a managing director of a firm, as a, one of my biggest identity shifts, having been an individual almost self-centered swimmer, um, you know, it's about me and my medals. But then I realized that as a leader, I had to stop being that person to a degree. Yeah, some of the personal qualities are important, but the egocentric bit where it was all about me, you shake, you have to shake that off. You know, when you're a leader, you have to understand that it's a very other centered. And I once saw a picture of me and Terry about two years after I started lane four. There's an old picture of me and my coach, my swimming coach. And I was realized I was trying to lead like Adrian the swimmer rather than Terry the coach. So actually I thought, what did Terry do? Because he was, he was brilliant. You know, he got the best out of 20, 30, 40 swimmers and got loads of kids beyond where they might have gone. And what he did was he believed in you, believed in you. 
he helped you when things didn't go so well. He asked you some really challenging questions and stretched you and he put his arm around you and supported you. And when I realised that my job as a managing director was to get the very best out of my direct reports and to really model him is when I started to release what understand what leadership truly meant, which is very other centred. It's very enabling. So if you're a leader as a head boy or girl, for me, there's something about your own humility, understanding the role you do have. Um, yeah, a bit of that. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, sure it will be. Sound advice. Um, I'm I'm um, I'm going to take inspiration from television interviews. I hope you might, don't might want me doing this. I'm going to put you yeah. on the spot with a a couple of very quick quick fire questions. Uh, so here we go with one of them. Um, which which do you enjoy most? Olympics, World Championships, or Commonwealth Games, and why? Enjoyable Commonwealth Games, fun. Canadians, Australians, the party afterwards was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then uh, if you can keep your Olympic gold or your MBE or your Sunday Times Best Leader Awards, which one of them are you going to keep and why, why are you going to pick it? The Sunday Times Best Leader Award. Um, because it, it, about the other side, I want to create an organisation where people love to come to work and I've, I, yeah, my ultra, I don't know if it, in later years, my altruism has gone <laughs> right over the side. But yeah, I, that, for me to create an organisation where people love to come is what I w ultimately wanted. The Olympic medal was a, a staging po post, post in my life. Wow. It's a heck of a staging post, to be fair. <laughs> and the, the management consultancy firm uh, that we've been talking about, uh, Lane 4, um, what's in the name? Uh, is, is Lane 4 a reference to swimming generally or is it something a little more personal? But it's very personal because it's the lane I won the Olympics in. Um, it's a lane for those who you know swimming. It's a lane you qualify into, so the fastest um, from the prelim semi-finals go into lane four, into the middle. So the idea is you get peripheral vision. You you can see every, all your competitors. It actually, for those of you who remember the old swimming pool at school, um, which is uh, I think where the music room is now, all that sort of practice rooms. Um, the old pool was very high sided, and being in the middle, you got less waves. So that's actually why the fastest went into the middle because you got the least turbulence, but now they're all deck level. The waves go out the end, so it doesn't matter. It's more about seeing your opposition and it's a favourites lane. And so that's kind of why we call lane four, lane four. But I didn't, it wasn't my idea, it was one of my partners. <laughs> gotcha, yes, thank you. Um, by the way, talking of the old swimming pool, um, the, the, um, the person from 1982 who's been sending messages about board robbers being thrown around, Andy, Andy Bray. Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you, Andy. He says, hi, Adrian. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, one thing that fascinates me uh, is how top sportsmen and women can be rivals one day and and friends the next. Uh, your rivalry with uh, Victor Davis is well known. Uh, Steve Lundqvist beat you in LA in 1984, so you take his world record off him a few years later. Um, were any of your rivals also friends? And if they were, did it make it harder to race against them? Um, I, yeah, I would. I wouldn't call them friends. I would say they they were friend. We were we were friendly in the end. Um, Victor, no, Victor and I didn't speak. We first met each other the eighty two World Championships, um, and we didn't speak for four years. We raced each other for four years, and we didn't say a word to each other. And he used to glower. He was a very angry boy, actually. Um, and we used to glower at each other. And uh, it was wasn't until I beat him in eighty six in his Olymp his world record event, the two hundred, that he kind of grudgingly respected me. We became friends. We actually had a few. Um, after swimming party moments um, where we cemented a friendship. Um, and then it, we, 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 but when I say friendship, we still, he was in Canada, I was in England. So it wasn't like we were best mates going hanging out together. It was more civil and friendly. Um, but no, in, in Britain, it was quite interesting in Britain because I lived with one of my cl close rivals, James Parrock, was uh, in the Commonwealth Games in Auckland in 90. We both represented uh, England, but we lived from Leeds and we lived in the same house. It was a sort of shared house of three or four of us. And that was interesting because we both tr were training to win the Commonwealth Games um, in, in Auckland. And interesting, he came second, I came first, he came second, and we were housemates. Um, it was hard because there were things when we get, when it came to, when it's in the year training, it's all right. But when you come to the last week or two weeks, it's really edgy. And so, and we didn't swim with this in the same lane. We had to train in different lanes in the last week. Yeah, but we were mates afterwards, it's fine. <laughs> Super. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come in from uh, people who are watching us this evening, Adrian. Uh, so I'm not sure if these are going to come in any sensible order, but hey, um, what advice would you give to BGS students? This is from Ros Dawson. 
Uh, what advice would you give to BGS students on coping with lockdown and the situation we're now in? And as a teenager, could you have coped with three months of no swimming? No. <laughs> no, no way, no way. I, well, it, interesting. Adam Peach has got yourself an endless pool, hasn't he? But I'm not sure as a teenager I would have been well known enough to get one of those. But um, no, I think it's very, very difficult. The fact the pool's not open now and the pub's are is really upsetting me a bit. Um, but no, so lockdown. Um, I, I was, I'm all right because I was a bit of an introvert. So I would forget swimming for a minute. I actually am quite good at being self motivated, actually. So I find things to do and I love reading and I love, I play backgammon online and Scrabble and all sorts of things. So I, I, it's, I'm, I love, I'm loving lockdown, frankly. Um, but as a student during that time, because my, I've got a 14 year old daughter um, and she's self motivated, actually, and yet she struggles. So there's something about, the social groupings and, and how you engage in what is schoolwork and what is social work. And I think that's really blurred at the moment. I think that must be so difficult. I think she's finding it hard, actually. The, the blur, because when you're at school, it's more in front of you, it's more there, it's more around you, whereas you have to engage differently with it when you're online and locked out, when lockdown. So I think motivation, it's interesting because motivation, I think, is all about doing something that matters to you in lots of ways. So I, for my younger kids, I've got three others. There's something about getting them to do what, what motivates them, interests them. I mean, it's easy when you've got a nine year old because you, know, you can do BBC bite sized maths and you can do some drawing and there's no GCSEs or A-levels to worry about. And so I, I really feel for those guys, for you guys that might be listening, that have, that's you know, hampered because it's not great. But on the other hand, I think you've just got to control what you can control and just keep going <laughs> do the process goals and you'll get there in the end but yeah never give up I'm, I'm not sure i ever said that i'm a tight i never give up <laughs> i never call myself a tight but um that never giving up thing you know people always tell you you can't do something so i just i used to say bugger them i'm just going to keep on going so i wouldn't worry about it being it's the same for everybody so I'm just going to keep going super, super. thank you uh, you mentioned motivation just then um, there's, there's another question coming again. It's anonymous on my screen. Um, how do you motivate yourself to get out of bed every morning, week in, week out, get in the pool and train? Um, you've got to love it. And I loved it. I mean, it's interesting when because people used to say that, oh, you had, you, you must have made lots of sacrifices. So I didn't make a single sacrifice. I just did it because I wanted to do it. And, and that's what all before my kids have been in swimming clubs and none of them want to do it. So I'm not pushing them. You've got to want to do it. And, and frankly, I, I motivate myself. And it's like now at work. I mean, I don't, I probably like mornings because of that, because I used to get up at five in the morning and I became conditioned, but I, I love mornings. I was up at five o'clock this morning. Oh, I don't, I'm not swimming. I was just doing some work <laughs> because I like it. I'll be, I'll be fast asleep at nine, but, <laughs> but who cares? <laughs> I've watched you and all me both. <laughs> um, but I, I've got I, a I message here from, from Richard Naroka, um, who says hi. Richard. hi. Yeah, hi Richard. Um, uh, he's, he's actually, I'm not sure if he's, he, I, I don't know if he actually wants me to ask this question or not, whether he's just being rude, uh, but hey, let's do it anyway. Um, he says, uh, I guess you'd say that your business success wasn't built on academic success at school. Hope I'm allowed to say that. How has that changed your attitude to education for young folks, perhaps including your own children? I, it's really interesting. It's a great question, Richard. I, and I, you know, Richard was one of those people that could do both. It was a brilliant cross country runner and uh, Cambridge doesn't get back up a bit. Uh, anyway, but yeah, I was hugely envious of you guys in the fast stream um, that could do both. And I, what I realised is I, because I now don't have swimming, I think I'm capable and I think um, you know, we all get education in different ways, don't we? And I think that the formal studying d didn't suit me as well, maybe, but I do pick stuff up. And I, and I think that because I, what I can do is one thing at a time, <laughs> so I couldn't swim and study. But actually now I don't have swimming, I do my work. But I approach it in the same way. And I remember thinking when I quit swimming, I think, well, lots of people are saying, oh, do a bit of media, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the other, a bit of appearances and a bit. Of... I'm going, well, actually, fragmented physically, fragmented mentally. At my best, I had a career. At my best, I did one thing. So now all I did was transfer all those things into, into business and I'm applying the same thinking. Um, so that's that bit. My own kids, oh yeah. It's, it's a heck of a challenge. Um, what will I do if they all flop through their A-levels? I mean, but the trouble is they know this because it's, it's, you know, they've read a few articles online. My 14-year-old, is she's a teen, oh man, she's a teenager and she's going through this thing where, well, dad, you know, why are you telling me to pass things? If I, you didn't pass anything, you did okay. Yeah, okay, good point. 
yeah, well, okay, but let's find something you really love doing. So what I'm trying to encourage them is to find the subjects and the things they love. And that's not easy. I know it's not easy. Find the te and the teachers. I, I have to say, guys, you guys, <laughs> what I've realised since I left school was there's some bloody great teachers. And there were some ones that were not so good. But on the other hand, the ones that were good, the life inspiration you got. So I remember them because of what they did and what they did for me in the environment. So L Lenny Butler was a classic example, the maths teacher. I failed pure and applied maths. And yet some of the lessons he taught me in those two years, I know I use today because I was in that environment with that man. Wow. I can't say, do you know what I mean? So it's like, well, what are you learning when you're at school? I was learning to be a, an adult. I was learning my way with, you know, putting effort in. I was learning my way with conflict and answering back and what's my identity in the world. I was learning all sorts of things. Some of it was given to me by swimming and some of it was given to me by BGS. I just didn't get paper with grades on it. <laughs> um, going back to the swimming, um, 12 years at the top uh, of any sport is a huge ask and, and sooner or later you slow down um, or certainly your body changes as you get older. Did, did the 18 year old Adrian Morehouse train differently to the 26 year old record breaker who you became? It, it changed, yeah, it changed towards 26. And I'll, I'll tell you what, it's interesting for those that are, you see the progress of people at Adam Peaty and where they are now, it changed because we had no idea when I was 18 about nutrition, physiology, some of the physiological advances that were made through the 80s was massive. You know, I, I never used to drink water. I never used to rehydrate during a two hour swimming session. I remember when this woman suggested it, when me and my coach looked at her and went, what are you talking about drink water while we're in the water? We're in water. And she went, no, no, you've got to rehydrate. We had no idea. And then I started rehydrating and by Friday, my energy levels, I was just surviving and doing better just because I was drinking water. I, I couldn't believe it. So what we, yeah, by the time I was 26, I was, I'd had spells at the Australian Institute of Sport. I, I, tr I truly understood. And Terry, Terry was brilliant, an innovative mind the cutting edge of physiology, biomechanics, nutrition, psychology. He, he and I were pushing it and we're trying to find who in the world could give us those different inputs. Um, but still, it's light years behind what they're doing now. And yet, yes, yeah, so when I was 26, I was doing some very different things, um, pushing all the boundaries I could, but we were, yeah, still weren't anywhere near what they're doing now. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's great, thank you. Um, and and go, looking a little bit further on, I, I remember hearing Steve Redgrave describing the challenges of training down uh, from a career in elite sport when he finally retired from rowing. Um, how did you make the transition from all those hours in the pool and the level of fitness that you had um, to what more pe mo most people would see, I suppose, as a, a more normal routine? <laughs> badly. <laughs> I transitioned badly. I stuck to a normal routine, which is I went to the pub. I put about a stone on, I drank gin and tonic every day and I didn't enjoy myself. Um, I didn't know how to do it. I, we didn't have any detraining then. It was pretty rubbish. Um, so Steve, yeah, he retired after me, didn't he, in the end? After his, yeah, I think he retired after me. So I think it was a bit more advanced in detraining. Um, no, I, I had a hard finish, hard stop. I won, yeah, I went to the Olympics. I retired in Barcelona, didn't go back to the city of Leeds to train, moved to London, had a completely different lifestyle and suffered badly physically and psychologically. Um, and that, it took me a while to get through that, actually. And I think that but I, I got back. I started to do some exercise, running, a bit of swimming. It took, it took me 10 years to get back to proper swimming to, as fitness. Um, but yeah, I struggled. Hmm. Oh yeah, again, like I said before, honest as always. Um, and 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 you you say you've got back to it. Uh, how how do you keep keep fit now? Are you are you back into the swimming at all? Are you you're regular in the pool? And do you enjoy it more now that it's there's there's less pressure? Um, or do you do something else instead? Yeah, I, d I don't swim in a pool. Um, it's a different goal. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting because like, I've I've got a whole thing about goal setting that I. Has part, been part of my life for a long time. But so if the outcome goal when you win, want to win the Olympics is the outcome goal, well, you're going to train 10 times a week. But if your outcome goal is to stay fit, there's lots of ways of doing that. You don't have to go in a swimming pool. <clears throat> um, but I run. Yeah, I do some running. Richard would be quite pleased to know. Oh, I'm rubbish at it. I run, I run like a duck um, and my knee's not great now. Uh, so I do that. I about, try and do 30 minutes every three times a week or something like that. But I walk a lot. I mean, particularly during lockdown, I have a busy old day on the screens. Um, and by 5.30, having got up at five in the morning, I switch off and I, I'm lucky to live near some 
great part of the world and I go walking. I do about an hour and a half every evening. After this, I'm off. I'm off till 7, 30, 8 o'clock. Um, and so walking, I go out lake swimming. So and I live by the river. So there's a group getting the river down the end of my road. So we jump in there every now and again. Um, not wetsuit now. So we come out of wetsuits. So we were in wetsuits in the lakes in uh, May, June. Oh, we had to sneak in the lakes, actually, because they weren't, they weren't open. So we had to go before they opened. <laughs> so it's like pushing the boundaries on the lockdown thing. Um, yeah, gotcha. Um, you, you mentioned all the things you're doing now, um, which I think partially answers my, my next question, which was as, as when you're running such a successful business, which must it must be such a, a drain on your time. Um, do you have to consciously make time for yourself or do you find it comes reasonably naturally to you to, to, to find time for you to decompress? Yeah, I, I think it's come from my sporting world, actually. I think I know how I, I burnt out once before 84. That was a burnout moment. Um, and when in my first two years in business, I, I get close to burning out. So starting up and you, you work in all, all hours. And I remembered that again at my best, I had these moments where I could self-regulate is my phrase. I mean, I, you have to stop yourself because if you love what you do, the only person that's going to stop you is yourself. And so rather do that before you become ill. Um, so yeah, I'm actually pretty good at it. I weekends because I have my kids at weekend. Well, every second weekend, so um, they don't live with me at the moment. But, so you know, I have a, a real beautiful switch off at weekends when I have the kids, or I do. I, I'm pretty good actually. I don't touch work at weekends. Um, and when I finish at five thirty, I finish. So I'm good at compartmentalizing things. Uh, I think. Um, so I look out and I look after myself. I think that you, it's fit for life sort of stuff. I, I do believe in that a healthy body, healthy mind, healthy spirit. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Um, and, and I'm conscious that we are running a little bit tight for time. I've got two more questions. I hope you won't mind staying on just a little bit longer. Um, you were talking recently about um, cricketer uh, Kevin Peterson uh, when you said uh, yeah. ability alone is not enough for people to reach their full potential. Did um, I say that? What do you think <laughs> are the most important qualities for talented people who want to achieve their potential? I'm not sure if I said that about Kevin Peterson. I wonder where that has come from. But um, anyway, <laughs> uh, ta is, talent, is talent alone? Is that what you're saying? What else do we? Uh, ability alone is not enough for people to reach their full potential. Yeah. Um, I, I was having a read of it. I, I, I believe it was on your blog. So if I've misquoted you, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> no, it, it won't be you. It'll be my marketing department that's misquoted me. <laughs> 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 no, they were gone. They were just chosen as Kevin Peterson's name. Um, no, but I, I do believe that. I, I actually, I saw lots of swimmers who were absolutely brilliant, it were beautiful technique and were, you know, just like fish. And yet they never made it through to where they could have got to because, I don't know, they they had almost like a, a self-sabotage switch, some people, I noticed. It's almost like they're so good and they decide to just do something ridiculous in the lead up to the games. Or one, one guy, I remember walking in his room and most talented 50 freestyler. And because I, I was team captain, I walked in his room, he was younger, and then, He's putting out a cigarette. What are you doing? He's, he's, but he's got some duty frees before we went out and meet. I went, you're never going to tell that. Anyway, so there's people with that, that sort of self-sabotage thing. Um, I also think that there's physical talent, but there's also all those things I talked about, your curiosity. curiosity. You see, if you're talented, but you, you've got this ego that thinks you know everything, you're not going to be as curious as you could be. And I actually suggest that school helped me with that, by the way. Um, being in the school environment, the Terry Dennison environment, was that you can never know enough. You'll never know what there is to know. So that curiosity leads you to explore different avenues. So I've seen very talented physical people with a limited mindset because they're too arrogant. And so, yeah, the, the physical talent isn't enough. And I've seen kids, I saw a five foot two Brazilian win the world championship swimming. And somebody said, oh, you can't win a swimming medal even unless you're six foot. This five foot two Brazilian, Ricardo Prado, won the 400 medley because um, he's got power to weight ratio. And it, it basically, somebody said, You can't do it. He said, Yes, I can. <laughs> so, who, 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 you know, he's because he was talented in different ways, right? Yeah, 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 great. Um, uh, finally, last question, and thank you so much for um, for being so patient with me this evening, right. uh, particularly when I was having a little bit of audio trouble earlier on, whichever end it was at. Um, I want to finish really with, with the fact that some some people are going to be listening who are going to be listening are going to be BGS swimmers, and I think it would be lovely to end with with one word of advice for them. Um, 
budding swimmers, they're already putting hours in the pool every day or many days at least. Is there anything in particular that you'd say to them? Or, uh, and what would you whisper in the ear of a, a swimmer who has the potential to go on to be uh, an, an international athlete? It's a very good question. And I've been asked it a lot and I don't have a, an off pat answer. It's really interesting. Um, I've got all sorts of things. I've got, I've got a platitude, which is never give up, <laughs> you know, because, you know, you'll lose lots before you win anything. Um, and interesting on that one, I remember losing my first Yorkshire Championship. I came second. I kept on coming second in all sorts of races because I did more than breaststroke when I was younger. So this one get one kid. And I remember talking to Terry. I said, look, I was 14 and he was always beating me. Always silver medal at Yorkshire, silver medal, silver. That was me. And I remember to Terry, I said, I'll never beat him. He said, well, just outlast him. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he probably quit when he's 15 or 16. Just like, you stay, you stay at the distance, you beat him. And he was, he was right. The kid quit by his 16. He was probably bored or something. And I, I won the national championships and he didn't because he wasn't there. <laughs> so just don't give up and then you'll, you'll outlast them. That's the first thing. Um, but the other thing I think is it's a hard sport, right? And if, if you know you're doing it for yourself, if you're not doing it for yourself, you won't see it through. Just you've got to bloody love it. And if you don't love it, find some bit of it you do love. And if you're doing it for your parents, stop doing it. Find something you love doing. If you're a parent pushing the kid to do it, stop pushing them. Because ultimately, and it's a sport, it's joyful, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And you should be enjoying, enjoying the process goals, enjoy training, enjoy getting better at turns, enjoy the stroke technique, enjoy listening to your coach. Yes, the coaches have wisdom. Um, so there's a bit of that going on for me when I think about young kids swimming, but you got to want it yourself because it's one of those sports that's true of anything in life right if you're going to put the hours in you've got to want to do it. you can't do it for anybody else yeah absolutely and, and you know what that that is that just a little pearl of wisdom which i think we could all keep in mind um adrian it's been an honor speaking to you uh thank you so much for sharing uh all your experiences of swimming and and also uh all of your um experience that you gained as a management consultant with us. Uh, I, I'm quite sure that everybody listening will have taken something away which uh, they will remember and will stand them in good stead. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, and uh, yes, uh, good evening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll go for a walk now. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, enjoy your walk. <laughs> Cheers. See you. Bye.